Haggerty Classic Car TV. Welcome everyone to this week's episode of Haggerty Classic Car TV. I'm Jamie Lamont and for this week our crew travels to the Peterson Automotive Museum in California to chat with Derek Hill, the son of legendary race car driver Phil Hill. Let's take a look. All right, we're standing here at the Peterson Automotive Museum in Los Angeles, California, and I'm standing next to Derek Hill, the son of the legendary race car driver Phil Hill, and we're next to two vehicles that have been part of the Hill family for, for many, many years. We have a 1931 Pierce Arrow and this uh, gorgeous, very original 1918 Packard. So, Derek, you know, let's talk just a little bit about uh, your dad. I mean, more people probably know him from his racing career and his achievements. Um, from that, but uh, you know, he was also had a love for very interesting, interesting and significant classic cars. He grew up around some interesting classic cars because his aunt actually was really a car nut, and she uh, bought this car, actually the 1918 Packard Town Car, while she was still living back in Cleveland, Ohio, uh, before my dad was born. Because he was born in '27. But he always remembered this being stored away in the garage growing up. And um, that was the beginning of his love of classic cars. Okay. Yeah. It's interesting to see what, you know, this paint, how it has reacted and almost shrunk over the years. But, you know, most people would take a car like this, especially in like the 60s and 70s, and thought, my gosh, we've got to restore it because it, it would. It, it would be an easy restoration. You basically repaint it, and it would look brand new. Well, you know, it could be a little bit of you know the uh, shoe cobbler having you know ratty shoes with holes in them and stuff. I mean, he was a professional car restorer in all the years after he raced cars. Uh, I think you know this was also his aunt's car and a car that he grew up in, in the 1931 Pierce Arrow. And this is a car that he, he did want to restore, and he and his brother did, actually. It's basically, this is still that restoration from, you know, what, 60 years ago? Yes, it is. Yeah, it's, uh, it's held up beautifully. I think it just goes to show, though, um, the quality in which he would put into a restoration. You know, he, he's obviously been known for many things, but what do you think, you know, speaking of the restoration side, what do you think he would want to most be remembered by, you know, uh, that represents his work? Well, I would say for sure, for him, a quality restoration was just as much about how something worked as much as how it looked in the end. Uh, everything needed to be absolutely as authentic as possible. You know, if they couldn't find uh, a part or it was missing a certain kind of a screw or anything, any sort of detail, he would make sure that they either went and found one or that they machined one and got it made to, you know, reflect the, the originality of the car. Mm -hmm. uh, but it was just as important to my father that things worked right. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and back then, every year, every car company was trying different sort of, uh, you know, new innovations in terms of what worked and what didn't. So, mm -hmm. to him, it was a real challenge to figure out how a, a different kind of carburetor worked or suspension or uh, any of those oddball things that they were trying in the early days of motoring. He just loved it. He loved figuring out how to make it work right. Well, and I guess that makes sense, you know, being such a successful race car driver. I mean, you know, when you're out on the, on the race course, absolutely everything has to work perfectly, otherwise you're not going to win the race. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I, I can see how that would carry over to his mindset when performing a restoration. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. all right, well, thank you so much for talking to us about yeah. this. All right, you're welcome. Thank you. The Studebaker Avanti is one of those cars you either love or hate, but if you're in the market for one, Jonathan and Rob have some great tips on what to look for before you buy. All right, I'm here with Rob Sass next to this 1963 Studebaker Avanti R1, and uh, we're going to talk a little bit about how it's performing in today's current marketplace. Avantis, I like them personally, I, I really do, but they're kind of polarizing cars from a style standpoint. You know, some people who love them, some people don't like them so much, and so consequently, they really didn't. Uh, get a bump from the big run up on muscle cars that happened from 2003 to 2008. But there's always been a pretty steady market for them. So my understanding of the market is you want one of two things with an Avanti. You either want air conditioning or you want a supercharger. Now you can't get both. Pretty much the cars that the collectors want that are performing well in the market you know, are air conditioned R1s or R2s with a supercharger. 
Um, pretty much what you'd expect to pay for a car that's just a driver, you know, that with, with a lot of needs, you know, anywhere from ten to thirteen thousand dollars is is driver level money for an R1 without some of those options that are desirable. You get up to an R2 with a supercharger and most of the time for a good quality car you're well over twenty thousand dollars and probably close to thirty or even more for a really really good uh, R2. So if a person's interested in purchasing an original Studebaker Avanti, you know, what are some things they should look out for? Just look for or make sure that you're actually looking at a Studebaker Avanti. Studebaker Avantis were built in the 1963 and 1964 model years only. Um, after Studebaker shut down in South Bend, a pair of Studebaker dealers from South Bend, uh, Leo Newman and Nate Altman, bought the rights to build the car as the Avanti II. They started that in 1966 with a Chevrolet Corvette engine. They look very, very similar to the Studebakers, but not the same thing and not the same collectability level. So that's the first thing you want to look for, is that you're looking at an original Studebaker Avanti. Second thing is, although these cars are made out of fiberglass, and obviously the bodies aren't going to rust, the frames are metal, they will rust very, very badly in salty areas. And again, there's a frame, there's an enforcement piece, a metal piece uh, that is uh, right underneath the doors called hog trough. Metal piece again that attaches to the frame, they rust too. They're replaceable, not a very easy or pleasant job to do, but again, you know, that's what to look for. As far as the mechanical bits go, the 289 Studebaker V8 was a pretty tough engine, the transmissions and everything, tough, straightforward, and most of the mechanical parts are readily available. If you've never had the chance to drive a Studebaker Avanti, you know, I can tell you that uh, you'll be pleasantly surprised if you ever do. This was my first driving experience in one. The factory disc brakes feel great. It has a very smooth clutch. Um, it sounds great. It's got a lot of power. It really feels like a sports car from the 60s. And uh, I love the dash. It has every gauge you could possibly need, but yet it's laid out very simple and easy to read. You can tell there's a lot of uh, aviation style. Um, influence on the interior design and uh, these are great cars. Well that's it for this week's episode of Haggerty Classic Car TV. Make sure you log on to Haggerty.com slash Classic Car TV for upcoming episodes and leave your comments below. See you next week.